When a brown girl child is born, the earth shifts. The sun is at half mask. The moon waits for her first cry. The ancestors set the table. The flowers turn red as blood. This is your land, continent daughter. With tree trunk legs and branches for arms, this is your soil. Black and fertile as your eyes facing an apartheid Jim Crow current past memory. Some of us begin the removal of shackles at birth. We grow into the armor of struggle quickly. We brew courage in our tea, blend bravery into our Sunday dinners. Joanne Watson, you understand nation building is not a part-time job. This dedicated life is sometimes lonely, a vulnerable choice, but it is the only way you know how to operate. You are wired for the movement in your black women bones, even when tired, still fighting, still organizing, still singing morning spirituals. You are born to lead, even in your own family wake up detroit this is your wake up call i'm joanne watson we're so happy to be with you today and we are co we're sponsored by the black congress on health law and economics foundation which is engaged in a 2020 get out the vote campaign moving from protest to power at the polls and we're delighted on this day to bring to you the topic of health and wellness during the pandemic how do certain stresses affect our ability to energize voters? We have some wonderful panelists, and I'm going to ask the attorney, Derek Humphreys, who was the founder of the Black Congress on Health Law and Economics, and our sponsor, to introduce the very special panelists on this day who are coming from across the nation, representing uh, Black expertise in health and wellness across the United States. Welcome, sponsor and our co-host, Attorney Derek Humphreys. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Honorable Joanne Watson. We're so pleased to be here with you on your program, Wake Up Detroit, the national edition. Thank you again. Thank you. Yes, we have today a, a group, a lineup of experts to speak about the issue of the impact of the, pan, the pandemic on get out the vote and what what we should be doing about it. And so we have today uh, Dr. Theopia Jackson, the president of the Association of Black Psychologists. My, Dr. My, Jackson. My. Dr. Jackson, welcome, welcome, welcome. Well known, I mean, she is renowned throughout the nation. Talk Amen. about somebody who's an expert in this field She's known all over the world, and it's such an honor to have her here on Wake Up Detroit. Thank you. We have That's joining us moment. also Dr. William Lawson, a member of the Black Psychiatrists of America. My, Dr. My, my. Lawson. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Lawson, uh, uh, great. Now, you know we're in good standing. We have the leader of the Black Psychologists and the leader of the Black Psychiatrists. My, my, my. <laughs> I'll tell you about it, tell you about it. And we also have Dr. Ladina, Dina Adams, yes. or here we are, Dina. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. welcome. Okay, welcome. And, and Dina just comes to us as, as we refer to her, comes to us as a result of being Alpha Kappa Alpha. Come on okay. now. All right. <laughs> Here we well, are. well, it's only right that you had the campus last week, so got the alpha <laughs> eight this week. Come on now. <laughs> okay. And so we want to just thank thank you. And we have uh do we have on on the call? Dr. Dr. Dennis Dr. Rogers. Dennis is here. Rogers. Okay. Dr. Dennis Rogers is of course with the Black Congress on Health Law and Economics, uh, who does the field operations. Um, he is the one who goes out across the country, speaks to all, all audiences, and carries the word in particular about this upcoming election on November 3rd. And so who, those who will be also joining us will be Joaquinia Clayton Clinton, who is with the Democratic National Committee, who has a stellar background in working with state legislators, particularly, yeah. particularly African American female yeah. legislators, and so, uh, and then Dr. Derek Johnson will be joining us, and we're so happy to have him. 
And of course, always and ever, the, the stable, the, the core of Black Congress on Health Law and Economics, Attorney Dorothy Jackson. So we have, there we have a fabulous lineup of experts who will share their thoughts with us as we move towards December, th I'm sorry, November 3rd, yeah. an election day. So there we are, there's the lineup. I don't think I've missed with anybody, missed anyone. And we thank all of them at the very beginning for being a part of this historic program, which goes out across the nation. And it can be heard by your constituencies through their various so social media. So thank you again, everyone. And we wanna thank you again, uh, Attorney Derek Humphreys for facilitating the sponsorship of the Black Congress on Health Law and Economics and these wonderful panelists who you've put together for today and the weeks ahead leading up to the November 3rd general election, a very important election. I do have to acknowledge the fact that even though you're in DC and you're national, you're founder of the Black Congress on Health Law and Economics, you're a Detroiter. Your mama might be watching, so I have to mention that. <laughs> help me, help me somebody. <laughs> He's a tough. Born in Detroit, eldest of 13, went to University of Michigan, and uh, was a football star in Michigan. And one of the things uh, he did was uh, earn his stripes working for the Honorable Coleman Alexander Young, Detroit's first black mayor, and the Honorable Ermel Henderson, who was uh, the matriarch of the city as she became president of the Detroit City Council. He uh, went to DC and became the counsel to the Congressional Black Caucus and uh, then began to counsel a number of the national black organizations. So we thank you. Oh. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you have done, not only for the nation, but also for Detroit. We thank you for that. I want to uh, now ask our sister, Dr. Theopia Jackson, with her bad self, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, my, my, to say a word about some of the stresses that you know are impacting people all over this nation because of this pandemic. And my flight might play a role in adding stress to the uh, our ability to energize the black vote. Right. First and foremost, thank you for this warm welcome. I'm, I had to look over my shoulder to figure out who you were talking about, this <laughs> sister who's so bad. Um, it's an honor to be here. I want to appreciate both you, Sister Watson, and, and Attorney Humphreys. And if I may, I want to take a moment to locate myself in the family. Um, giving a shout out to my Detroit chapter who are holding it down in terms of the Association of Black Psychologists. Yeah. More specifically, I want to honor my big sister, Orr, as I come to you as a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, oh, out of Alpha <laughs> Chapter at Howard University, and we are lifting up our sister Harris, okay? So just want to right. make sure we understand yeah. that it's beyond these degrees, and it's really about who we are in the family. Our family That's needs right. to know that we are fully showing up and representing. You better um, say it. <laughs> well, I, you, you, you've invited me, so thank you for doing that as well. Too, right? and, and so collectively, we're going to honor our, our recent elder and uh, our newest ancestor, John Lewis, and in getting into some good trouble by yeah. utilizing this type of platform to take our messages broader, clearer, and to have these types of critical conversations across and among us. So, to, so now I will definitely get to the question you, you've invited me to start with. And what I would say about this is first and foremost, I have to put it in context, we are, need to be very clear that this is not the first pandemic for us. We've been That's seeing right. and seen and unseen pandemics since we met certain people in life. Oh, okay. oh. So, and so more <laughs> specifically, we already have uniquely and deeply the capacity to not only move through, but show true hum humanity. Our challenge in doing so is recognizing that power. I'm, I'm because on. the impact of being engaged the way in which we have is that we're sitting in systems that not only deny who we are in our physical body, but they deny our wisdom, our I'm cultural on. knowledge. And so in some ways, no matter what our industry is, if it's psychiatrists or psychologists or whatever, we're socialized into a Western academia that either omits who we are at, at best and then more intentionally denies who we are. Well, well. So any one of us have to go through the capacity to first recognize that so we can have a deeper understanding of the stressors that we're sitting in. When, we think, when, when people talk about how COVID has been impacting folks with the increase 
of um, suicidal ideation or the increase of anxiety and depression. Yes, that's true for all of us. But we as people of African ancestry have a deeper dive and a deeper risk. So those tools that are meant to sort of um, address those typical or um, um, more Western-like responses of anxiety to this yeah. are not deep enough to get into our wounds, which is why I would submit to you that we are sitting in this racial pandemic in this moment. Because well, if our health psychologies really understood what's going on and did its job, we should never have had not only all the deaths, we definitely should not have had that that murder that was felt around the world, that eight minutes and 46 seconds when we honor oh, what happened to, to our dear brother, um, George Floyd. I would submit to you this level of psychological, psychospiritual, and stress that we are all experiencing mm -hmm. in humanity, but more deeply as people of African ancestry, happened under their watch. Hey. You said so that. clearly whatever tools came through are not here. So I'll close by saying, so, so what are some of the ways of quote, countering this? First and foremost is naming the disease, That's naming right. the problem, understanding that, this, that we are all contending with the lie of, of, of the myth of white supremacy and the lie and myth of black inferiority. It just shows up and manifests itself differently depending, depending on the context. And as some of you may know, I'm getting a lot of heat right now for naming that truth and having the American Psychological Association acknowledge that truth, that every yeah. industry is born from the blood of white supremacy ideology and capitalism. So if we move beyond simply the, the limitations of saying, are you racist, are you not? But forget that, we're all inoculated with some level of racism. For us as people of African ancestors, for us, it's internalized racism. The ways in which we don't recognize ourselves, or more importantly, do the damage of the master. They don't Man. have to do anything. We, in our scholarly ways, have already sort of said to our people, the COVID's hitting you worse because of your, pre, your preconditions and, and how you don't take care of yourself. That is the work of the master, because the realities Andrew. are our people have those preconditions because of the systemic situations they're sitting You better in. say it. So I'll stop there to allow my dear colleagues and, and mm. others to join in because I'm excited about this moment to learn from, learn with, and all you're doing is activating me further. So thank you. Go ahead, my sister, Dr. Theo Jackson. Yes. Uh, we praise God for Dr. Jackson, who is the president of the National Association of Black Psychologists. And it's a good transition to move to Dr. William B. Lawson, a uh, black psychiatrist of America. Dr. Lawson, now give us uh, your, uh, your particular perspective on the same issue, how the pandemic is impacting the stress backdrop of uh, Africans in America as uh, we uh, try to our, do our very best to organize people to get out the vote during this pandemic. I can't do anything but second everything that was said already. Um, just want to note that um, I'm a past president of Black Psychiatrists of America, current president, uh, Dr. Ben Roy. Uh, but also, uh, we're celebrating the end of the term of the Elder Stewart, who's the first president of the American Psychiatric Association, who is African-American. And it tells something about where we are in terms of the professional organizations in recognizing, frankly, uh, that we exist. And it's important now because I've spent most of my career in terms of understanding why do we have these disparities. And when I mean disparities, I mean why in terms of this pandemic is the disease hitting us uh, more than other groups. Um, and this reflects a whole bunch of different health conditions in terms of why do we have not only more commonly these disorders, but also are much less likely to get treatment. Why has this been going on for a number of decades, uh, despite multiple programs, despite major community efforts, despite others, and it still persists? And part of it has to do with how we see ourselves and how the community sees us. One of the ways in which we see us, one of, there was a study done uh, a couple of years ago involving the um, University of Virginia medical students in which they were discovered that they persistently to see black people did not experience pain. And I extend that further. Not only is there a perception that we do not experience physical pain, but we also do not experience psychological pain. And thus problems such as depression, 
post-traumatic stress disorder are just ignored in our community. And as a result, the pandemic has a greater impact than it really should have. Folks learn almost a sense of learned helplessness because no matter how much they express their concerns, no matter what can be done with it, they're ignored or, the, or their concerns are discounted. That's why I look at this as a layering. We had the problem of not only the pandemic in terms of the coronavirus, we have another pandemic in terms of black folks being killed by the uh, police department and by other groups. And we also have the pandemic in terms of our own community, of yeah. uh, folks themselves in. And yeah. we have now we have a new pandemic in terms of people dying from opiate abuse. And yeah. I'm right there, that's a new one because the white folks were dying originally. Now we are dying. And mm. I contend that the underlying factor for all of these is the same. One is structural racism. The other is the ignoring of the impact of the pain and suffering that our community have, and also a failure to evolve structural institutions to make these changes. The Black Psychiatrists of America and other groups recognize early that we ourselves are going, not going to be able to solve this by working within our professional boundaries. I keep hearing folks say, I'm not going to step out of, step out of our lane. We cannot afford not to That's step right. out of our lane. That's right. We've got to work other kinds of groups. So we're working it. with um, various church groups to try to inform the community about this uh, virus. We're working with the barbershops, the beauty parlors, to spread the word that there is something that can be done. It works another way. Uh, the damage that's being done is in another way. Um, of course, dealing with that virus, um, folks have sheltered in. Um, but as a result, um, folks don't have, uh, initially didn't seem to have the energy to get out to do things like voter registration, voter activity. What this is doing is forcing us to be able to think outside of the box. We cannot use traditional ways of addressing these concerns. That's right. We can, we're going to have to develop new ways of getting to the polls. We're going to have to develop new ways of being able to spread the word in our community. And the good news, I think, is that we've had to do this historically. If we go back to slavery times, we had to develop unique ways to get around the oppression of the institution. If we go back to the mother country, look that there are a lot of creative ways that, uh, that existed in the past that we may have to reinvent or redevelop to be able to try to address the concerns that we're facing. So we're facing a major, major problem. The uh, real bad news, that I think, is not so much that there's a pandemic going on and that we're trying to mobilize. The real bad news is that we've been in many of these circumstances before and have not moved the bar to the extent that we'd like to move it to make meaningful change in our community and our access to the resources of this country. So and hopefully this time we'll be able to lay a foundation to be able to move forward so any other act events like this, and there are going to be more pandemics, there are going to be more physical problems, there are going to be more emotional stresses, that in the future we'll be able to have laid down some bases to we resist institutional racism and to build on our own culture right. in a unique way so that we can address the concerns of our country. Thank you so much. I appreciate your sharing. And you, you took a deep dive into how this is impacting our various communities. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Dr. Lavina Adams or Chief Medical Officer, Medicaid Managed Care Organization in Washington, D.C., uh, you uh, are in a, a, a significant position to be able to see what's happening on the ground with our people. Yes, good morning and thank you for the privilege of, of, of being with this esteemed group of colleagues this morning. Um, from the grassroots level, the stressors are definitely there. We have um, our, 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 our community that is struggling with understanding what to do. Sometimes with some things as basic as, should I wear a mask, should I not? Because the leadership of this country is confusing everyone. So we constantly are reinforcing the, the, the key things that we've always done as a community. Wash our hands, keep your distance, and protect yourself. Everyone knows that this is respiratory spread, 
person to person, cough, sneeze, talking. And the best way to protect me is to protect you. And, and so I think that the stresses associated with voting are people trying to figure out, should I go to the polls? Should I not? What do I do? How do I get there? Especially if you have competing priorities, like where am I going to live? We have a lot of folks that are in shelters. Where am I going to get food? We have a mm -hmm. lot of food deserts. And so the, we always had some of those things, but now it's compounded because a lot of folks don't have employment that they used to have. I applaud our frontline workers because they are at risk every day. And that stress layered upon everything else is causing us to be uh, a little bit confused, but I know we're going to pull through this because COVID-19 is forcing us to do things differently and go back to some of the basics like Dr. Lawson referred to. We are home more, we are eating healthier, we are walking because you can't go anywhere else, and we are exercising. And all of those things help us to reduce our stress. So we've got to get back to the basics and stick to the basics. That's how we've survived over every generation. That's what we go back to. Well said. Appreciate that perspective and, and your expertise and your commitment to our community. Mm -hmm. Thank Let you. me bring forth Wakania Clinton, Senior Advisor to Chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Welcome to uh, Wake Up Detroit and Wake Up World. So happy to have you here and talk to us about the, the national agenda as it relates to this mission to uh, recruit uh, the vote amidst the pandemic. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you, Ms. Watson, and to this esteemed panel uh, of, of guests here, and to the people of Detroit. Uh, I was just in Detroit a couple of weeks ago there with uh, Ms. Virgie Rollins, who is our- My, my, my. Yeah, that is our DNC Black Caucus Chair. I know it. A series of amazing events uh, from Detroit, and so I had some time to spend with her on the ground, and I will tell well, she you- she is a powerhouse, not only nationally, but also, as you know, in Detroit, she, uh, both of us were mentored by Congressman John Conyers, mm -hmm. and, uh, and she, uh, she just is a, a, an absolute fireball for the Democratic <laughs> Party here. Absolutely. Um, Ms. Virgie uh, has been a tremendous help to me. She's been my mentor in my three years here at the DNC, and I can tell you, you don't, Detroit has no better fighter than Virgie M. Rollins. And so I wanted to lift her up um, this morning as, we, as I join you from, uh, from the DMV area. So, you know, this, this election cycle is going to be unlike any other I think we've ever experienced. Uh, and I think, you know, as, um, as active participants in the process, I think it, it really is incumbent upon us to ensure that we are educating and informing and empowering and engaging folks uh, on every single level. Like it literally is leave no stone unturned. That's right. We have an administration that we cannot rely on. Hey. Uh, every, every part of uh, what we know as democracy is being challenged in this very moment. And uh, I think what, what voters are going to see and what they need to know is that be, um, be ever relentless in your pursuit to exercise your right to vote this election cycle. That's um, right. We're you're being, let me say that you're being very kind, my sister, very kind. <laughs> but the truth is uh, that occupant uh, needs the services of the Black psychiatrist and a black psychologist so go ahead baby no <laughs> you, you're absolutely right i mean you know i don't know if you all have been following what's been happening but we just got a recent discovery around the bob woodward tapes and what you know what what this president knew and when he knew it and how he intentionally put the lives of americans at stake and now you know we've seen within the last months his attacks on the u.s postal service i mean we just saw i think i just read this morning where Patients are complaining about not getting their medicine in the mail. And, you know, for communities like ours, who, you know, we live in multiple uh, circumstances throughout this country, we rely heavily on the postal service for simple things, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like medicine. You know, like our, you know, checks and things of that nature, income for our seniors. And so, you know, when I think about what should be motivating folks to get to the ballot uh, this November, it is that your very existence is on the line. This is not about democracy. This is about existence. Hey. This, your, your ability to breathe and live and function in this country. You know, you have a president who, too, I think it was to Ms. Orr's point, who, who basically said, uh, don't worry about it. Kids are relentless. 
right? They, they can they can they can manage this this crisis. No worries. We just saw where you have over five hundred thousand new cases among children. Right? It's it's a, over a seven hundred percent increase in the number of cases among young children in this country. You know, and so. I think when when you talk about the challenges that we're going to be facing, yes, it, you know, people, we are we are encouraging folks um, to request your ballot. Today is uh, actual request your ballot day hey. <laughs> across the country. So if you can do that, you should do that, right? And 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 just because you request your ballot in the uh, by mail doesn't mean you have to return it in by mail. You can actually take it to your clerk's office That's and right. turn your ballot back in if you're concerned about being purged from polls, if you're concerned about being able, you know, to actually cash a ballot due because you have to go to work in this pandemic and, you know, lines may be long or whatever. There are ways that we are activating people in this country and encouraging them to participate in the process. For those of folks who can take off, please take off because we need election day volunteers. Unlike ever before, you know, traditionally in this country, our poll workers have been our elderly. They have a little bit more time um, to, to volunteer on that day, but we're not going to see that this election cycle to be honest with you so if you have the flexibility please take it you know take the day off and lend um lend your services to helping us ensure as many people in this country are able to vote we've seen it you know for the last 50 years in in, in my opinion where the attack on the vote has been real ever since we've been solidified in our right to be able to vote we've had attacks and attacks and attacks and attacks right. happen on that and we have to be just as Dedicated as some people are to taking that vote and, and watering down that vote for us, we have to be just that dedicated to ensuring that our vote remains in place and remains intact because it's too much. That's right. Vote. That's it's right. And people in positions of power should sponsor legislation uh, to make sure that uh, it, it, where they can, where it can happen that election day has become a holiday, a local holiday. You know, and we and we talked about that. I mean, we've been that's been a narrative for so many years, and I think you have to realize that there is a vested interest in people not making that possible, which That's is why right. we have to have a vested interest in ensuring that we're electing people to office who That's will right. ensure that that becomes a thing. You know, we've seen um, in this upcoming election cycle, you have more black people running for public office probably than ever before. You know, yeah. particularly in the deep South, you have five different Senate races that are coming out of the deep South uh, that are represented by black Democrats um, to buy for the Senate. We could flip those races, and it takes all of us everywhere to do that. You know, um, when we think and about all of us together can make a difference. It's the bottom of the hour, and let me remind everyone that this is a special Get Out the Vote edition of Wake Up Detroit, Wake Up World, and the sponsor, BCHLE, the Black Congress on Health Law and Economics Foundation, and our wonderful sponsor, Attorney Derek Humphreys, is here, and he's helped organize a, a magnificent panel of uh, <laughs> national experts. Uh, from this uh, national community. And uh, we're just so blessed to have all of you present. So we're grateful to the Black Congress on Health Law and Economics, RJ Watkins, uh, HT, Henry Tyler, Maxine Willis, and to all of you for being a part of our wake up call. Thank you for being part of this very special get out the vote edition of Wake Up Detroit and Wake Up World. Uh, thank you all for being here. Let me also ask uh, uh, Dr. Dennis Rogers. So, uh, to chime in and uh, Attorney Dorothy Jackson. Well, thank you, um, Mrs. Watson. It's always a pleasure to be here with you at Wake Up Detroit and Wake Up World. Um, you know, I was listening to the, the first speaker and she was talking about the notion of white supremacy. And we know from Francis Cress Welsing's uh, writings and teachings and Neely Fuller, of course, that until we understand white supremacy, the rest of this makes no sense. But the moment we understand it, that we're swimming in infected water, we're breathing infected air, then all of this makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So that um, in the midst of being under attack, we have to take care of ourselves physically. That's why I'm drinking my ginger juice, ginger tea and blueberry juice this morning. And we also have to take care of each other. And, and when the Black Congress on Health Law and Economics made the decision this year to be engaged in the cycle. We also looked at what's going on across the board. We know that, for example, the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund has a 1-800 number, 866-OUR-VOTE. And that number is set up so that if people are experiencing troubles at the polls, they can call and report that. 
We also encourage that we reach out to our secretaries of states in our respective states in advance of election day to begin addressing these issues, the trick, tricky issues that we know this particular administration is engaged in. Well said, well said. Now, Dr. Jackson, attorney, uh, extraordinary attorney, Dorothy Jackson. Good morning, Reverend Watson. Thank you for the warm welcome. I had some technical difficulties in the beginning, but I'm here now. But God is good, you're here. All That's the right. time, all, all the time. time. All the time. <laughs> what what I wanted to talk about, I guess my interests are very parochial to a degree. Um, Dr. Orr talked about the food deserts because of the pandemic and people staying home, people eating healthier, people exercising. My concern is about the parents of young children, their budget being stressed because usually in some homes, children especially ed um, elementary age they get two meals a day in school breakfast and lunch and sometimes a snack if they go to aftercare so the parent really only has to concern themselves with dinner so you put into the budget now having to provide all the meals and the you know the breakfast and lunch that's usually served in school the parent with the stress of working or not working and maybe having two or three children that they have to teach with no training virtually. And now we have to ask ourselves, does the school system give one laptop by fam for a family or do they give a laptop per child in the school system? So you put all those stresses on a parent and then we come along, those of us, especially like Joaquinia, um, the Black Caucus on Health Law and Economics and the organizations that Dina and Dr. Lawson and everybody belongs to, whose purpose and goal is to register, educate, and motivate voters. So with the psychologists and the psych Dr. Lawson and Dr. Jackson, do you have any suggestions other than the things you've already said about how you would go about overcoming this feeling of helplessness that you talked about, Dr. Lawson, or just feeling depressed and you can't go on. So how do you motivate somebody and educate them to see you have to vote? Because as Joaquinia said, that's the answer to your problems, to get these people who don't care about you and who are causing these economic stresses and food deserts, et cetera, et cetera, to get them out of office. So you have to be able to explain to them in a way that they can understand, like meeting them where they are, mm -hmm. how you mm -hmm. juxtapose all of these things and get yourself motivated to participate in the election. And I might add, before you answer, that we keep in mind in our answers the Maxim, teamwork makes the dream work. Yes. Teamwork makes the dream work. And so we have a team here that spans the nation from the south to the north, from the east to the west. We have here sororities represented in addition to the professional society. We have members who are leaders not only in your communities, but also nationally. And when we think about how to elevate the truth, and I quote to you the headline from the Washington Post this morning, and it says that Trump knew of the coronavirus dangers, but says in Bob Woodward's book that he minimized the threat to avoid panic. Quote, I want it to always play it down, not tell the truth. So how do we act together, make the teamwork, realize the dream and make it work? So please go ahead, Dr. Jackson. So um, thank you, and I'll be very brief as I've been taking down notes. I appreciate this. 
First and foremost, I would suggest that we are much more intentional in doing what ABCI is trying to move forward, which is culturally grounding our people in who we are. It goes back to what um, Dr. Rogers was saying, that we have to understand the complexity we're sitting in in order to make informed decisions and even accept the um, invitations to vote, the invitation to participate in the census count. If you, don't, if you don't know who you are and whose you are, then you're blinded by everything else. So with the Association of Black Psychologists, we have been adopting this concept, African concept called Zola Up On Us. And this is a, an activating love. It's a protective love. It's a generative love. And we have Zola Up Mondays that where our um, members are hosting um, podcasts and others just to kind of feed the people's psycho spiritual souls and minds so they can right. feel they can feel the love again mm -hmm. it goes back to what sister jackson saying that we have to move beyond leaving our families in isolation in the mess that's mm -hmm. what other folk do what has gotten us through is each one reach out lock arms how you doing babe i know i can't see how can i help what do you need if it means dropping off tangible food at the doorstep or even calling in and saying hey can i do your baby's lesson around english or reading while you go take a nap because this tool both our cell phones and this type of technology should be used for our good, we need to control it and put it in those places. I also want to honor, forgive me, I can't remember which one of my colleagues said this, I think it was my dear Sora um, Clanton who said this, but this, this idea of we cannot be limited by the prescriptions given to us by the industries in which we sit. I think it was Dr. Loss who said this. For, shame on us if we do stay within our own hallowed halls. Shame on us if we stay in our 50 minute therapeutic session. That's right. Shame on us if we are, are, are not actively going out with our people because we are experiencing the exact same disease that they are right now. We all know that every time somebody catches a cold, hey, we get right. pneumonia. There you and go. We don't need anyone to tell us that this mess is real. So, so for me, the question is not whether or not I wear masks. The question is if I understand my history here. That's right. Why wouldn't I wear one? Come on now. Even because the risk is too great not to do it. So I also want to close by giving these practical things is we, we should be holding each other accountable. So, so how do we continue this conversation but have a true generative black collective where we are talking with educators, mental health, hold us accountable as black psychologists. How do we add to the psychological health and well-being of our people in a more generative way? And we've been trying to do this as I said, not only through the Zola Up, we've also been launching a series of webinars that, again, are, are accessible. We're trying to deliver the message in the, in the language of our people. I said it that way because it's not about talking down or up. It's like we have to speak so our people can hear us and understand us. And more importantly, that we hear and understand them because they have community wisdom. They've been trying to tell us something for a long time, but the system has not allowed them to. So they sit in silence. This is our time to say, what do you need from us and how do we do this together? How do we not leave the families in, the, in such a tense place that's going to raise the probability of self-harm, harm to each other? I want to submit that all of us bring our children into this world to love them. Something goes amok when we end up hurting them. That's right. And that's they exactly all belong right. to us. So everybody should be reaching out. We should be writing letters to each other, sending good cards, lifting up in prayer and, and divinity, doing Say our it. rituals, calling our ancestors. Our power goes beyond the practical right here in front of us. Lift up. We sit here lifting our people now. Someone is driving to work right now, hearing this for the first time. Someone else is, this is part of, we're doing the juju, we're doing the Zola up, but we just have to be more intentional and I'll close by saying, shifting our language out of the deficit model, out of the victim stance, or out of trying to always understand what's happening to us. We got that. What we're not doing enough of is courageous healing conversations. Go ahead. I'm definitely, when I say, how are you doing? I don't mean, so no, I'm gonna sit down, Sister Clay, how are you really doing? Because sometimes it means critically listening and not judging. Truly understanding that what, not what's wrong with that person, but what happened in her life, or his or her, or their life, that led them to the situation in which That's they're right. in. That, I think if we can do that and, 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 and challenge ourselves to be creative, generative, and bold, 
just to bring whatever it is we think we have in any space we come into and learn from one another. Because we do have the capacity to do this, but we cannot do it if we don't remember who we are. Another Ooh, say that, shout say out that. for is um, Dr. Noble's created for us a um, shelter in place workbook, right? Because you know, turn every, every chaos comes with opportunity. This is an opportunity to have multi-generational conversations about the, about the beauty and the brilliance of blackness. That's it. That's it. You know, and in doing that, that has to activate us to take a more responsibility and better understand why we should and could and claim our power to vote, should and could and claim our power to demand that people are, are, are safeguarding and wearing masks, to should and could and would claim our power to make sure we are also tapping into the census count, because it's that census count, too, that is just as empowered that we're missing, because, again, we're, we're, we're locked in a dichotomous conversation. We have to make sure that we say vote, we say census as well, too, and vote across the board, not just at this presidency. That's exactly right. I love the uh, reference to... Uh, uh, Noble's uh, reflection on multi-generational. It's in that intergenerational connection that has allowed us to be here. We're here because somebody's big mama stepped right. in. <laughs> stepped in. And it <laughs> goes help. beyond. And it goes beyond hey. legal and bloodline. We are a family. Like my sister here, right. we might be in different sorority, but we know. Look. All I got to say, the charge is on us right now. If we hey. do not get Sister Kamala mm -hmm. Harris into that office, shame on all HBCUs right. and, the, and the Divine Nine, because this is our time to hey. lock and load and show that collective power. <laughs> what, what, can you, what, can you, what say you to that? I said she said a mouthful. Um, <laughs> but I, I would also add, like, as we talk about the things that we know to do, we have to also acknowledge access. It has always been a challenge for us. So as we talk about, you know, uh, using our PPE, as we talk about, you know, mobilizing communities to go out and turn out the vote, we live in, and I think it might have been um, 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 Lavina, La, uh, Ladina, or um, or another member of the panel who mentioned. Uh, the fact that we live in food deserts, so we have we have food insecure communities, and but we also have transportation insecure communities. We have communities that still live within the digital divide. I think it was Dr. Jackson who alluded to, uh, no, Dr. Uh, Attorney Jackson that alluded to the fact that um, most of these households don't even have computers in it. I mean, I think it was um, um, there was a, a study done uh, a while ago that talks about the fact that most black and brown households access to the internet is through their mobile devices. That's and right. so how big of a challenge does that present to our students who, who are trying to log on to the Zoom for class, but can't do it, you know, or that, you know, they have to use, use a mobile phone to try to see their classmates or whatever. And how, what kind of restrictions and stress does that add to households and families? And so I think as we think about this election cycle and we think about the detrimental impact this administration has had on the economy for black folks, you know, we really have to take a step back. Some folks are saying, oh, no, nah, he ain't been that bad for black folks. So I was like, well, I don't know what black folks you know, but the ones I know uh, are out here from hand to mouth in a different type of way. You know, you talked about the stresses on budget. You talk about the number of black businesses that have closed under this administration because of their lack of access to PPP funding. You know, most of our, most of our businesses are uh, 1099, you know, That's most right. are running as independent contractors, whether they're barbers or beauticians or whatever, you know, whether or not they took out their last part of savings to start that family restaurant. And now they're having to re readjust the way that they provide services. I mean, look, we are very, creative community. We know how to make something out of nothing, but we are far beyond that time. You know, we're in a time where we deserve um, access to the same resources that we pay into. You know, we pay into this government, but yet this government does anything to return the favor to us. And so I think we have to uh, start thinking about how we when we go to vote, we need to start thinking about the issue, not just who's on the ballot, because we do have an extreme opportunity. And if we fail this opportunity, you are absolutely right, Dr. Jackson, it is on us. We've been crying about leadership and, you know, black women lead and black folks need power, positions of power. But now we are one step away from presidency. And what does that look like? Sister Clayton, let, let me ask you a question here. <clears throat> you are at the, in the nation's capital. 
and you're working from a central point, from a central organization in the business of making certain that people get out and vote. So sitting next to you, as I look at the, the cameos here, sitting next to you are the leaders of national organizations who ha have boots on the ground in different communities. One of the challenges that I hear as an attorney for most of them is that nobody has reached out to our chapter in Detroit or in Miami or in Greensboro. Nobody has reached out. It's as if it exists, this whole exists in ignorance of the fact that there is a network of organizations and professionals who want to be involved and it will take time from their work to be involved. And I say to you, and I share with you, it's something that you already know because we've talked about it in the past. The Gallup poll says that those in the United States who have the greatest cre credibility are nurses and doctors. Well, we have Dr. William Lawson here. We have Dr. Theophio Jackson here. We have Dr. Orr here. We have Dr. Rogers here. We have Dr. Watson here. And we have the Juris Doctor myself. But <laughs> if we did a poll right now, would we see those influential voices which are multiplied throughout the country through their chapters involved and brought into what the what is being done from the hill in Washington DC? Are we being brought in to Great be question. a part of the, the national Great. mobilization and provided with resources to be part of the national mobilization? My dear, thank you. Well, I would answer that question quite honestly. And I would say if you're asking the question, then the answer is probably no. The outreach has not happened, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, or the engagement has not happened. I think the challenge working with associations um, is that legally you can't right so for me and, and but this is where the opportunity lies right because now i know you all in a personal capacity so yeah. i can make the personal outreach to each of you to do what i call relational organizing hey okay i'm a real organizer i got my start in naacp hey hey <laughs> i might not be a Jewish doctor but i am hbcu educated Talk and I know that. Uh, that's a PhD in black living if you ever need one. So, <laughs> so, but what, what I will tell you is this. I mean, and, and this is all on an on a, on a honest and serious note. You know, I, I am concerned under this administration about how we engage our black organizations. I really am. And I'll tell you why. Because in the past, you've been able to kind of like set a precedent. Here are the things, here are the tips you need, and these are the things you can do. And you can get that information publicly, and we have that information available to people publicly. But to your point, Attorney Humphreys, if you don't have the connection, in, like I've known Doc, uh, Attorney Jackson for years. You know, yeah. she saw me grow up yeah. <laughs> through, through the CBC and other spaces, right? I've known you from when I, I worked for Dr. Elsie Scott uh, as her assistant when you were the attorney to the board of the CBT uh, F Foundation. And so like those relationships are still intact, but sometimes we need refreshers about where our relationships actually really lie. I tell people the same way that you do a spring clean now in your house, you gotta do the same thing with your network. Figure out who you know and where you know them. You know, those are some of the tips and tools you learn in organizing. And there are some other tips and tools that you learn uh, in raising money. And so now that we're in a different space, and now that I have not personally met all of you, and now we all have all have personal relationships, I will do my uh, level best <laughs> to engage you uh, in the things that we need. Because listen, we 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 the toolkits. We you know we've gone out, we've done the outreach. We rely heavily on our DNC members to really help us identify and connect with organizations on the ground because they have those one on ones. But now we're in a different element, and yeah. I think taking every opportunity like the ones we have today to say we need you. And there are ways you can plug in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let everyone know right now. If you need, if you want to get plugged into the work that we're doing at the National Party, you can text the word "join" to four three three six seven. 
We will get you plugged in. There are tons of volunteer opportunities with our, our national party, with our candidates and others. And so we just need folks um, to, to just say that they want to do it because we need all the help. I'll give my personal email address to everyone on this call because I, I really want if you want to be a part of this uh, election and be a part of shaping it in a different way beyond just voting in this election, then we need to be talking and we need to be working together. And so I'm happy to do that uh, with each of you who are interested in mobilizing your various networks to help turn out this election. And it is a different time. Yeah. The reality is that uh, years or decades ago, I was the first woman director of the Detroit NACP, the largest branch in the country. Come on, uh, however, my, my role in getting out the vote then is much different than it would be now because the social media is, is the wherewithal for the millennials. They, we, we, we would not be able to have the same kind of success uh, with getting out the vote using the uh, uh, methods used in uh, 1990. Back in the day. You have, you have to move, transition with the season and there ought to be a significant transition there it, which ought to mean also making sure that you invest in those populations who invest in you i went to the white house years ago decades ago to, uh, with a number of other black talk show hosts to talk about why why all the people who are running for office typically pay money to white media but they want to come on black media for free God, amen. So, you know, the, 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 that, that issue has still not been uh, made manifest in terms and, of... And I will just add to that, uh, Reverend Watson, because you're right. Traditionally, that has been the case. But in fact, I will tell you that the Biden-Harris campaign has spent more money, not just on Black and Black, uh, on radio shows and television shows, but with Black owners around, Black media owners. And so they made a substantial... Um, Add by, and if you haven't, uh, if WHPR hasn't heard from them, I can connect you with their African uh, African American media buyer so that you can plug into that because you know Michigan will forever be a battleground state, and we are investing mm -hmm. uh, tons of money at the state party level with organizers. In fact, we funded uh, a multi million dollar organizing program that had a seventy, I think it was seventy three percent of organizers of color in that program and 94 percent of them were homegrown michigan was one of those states so whether and homegrown means either you are from there or you go to school there and we trained and paid those organizers through the summer to train on how to do this organizing work so when it came time up to re-up for the coordinated and for the national campaign that they were able to plug into those systems and so you see a lot of those young organizers that went through that program who are now working for the biden harris campaign and we and again i can and i and i will definitely do that connect you with uh cameron tremble because he leads all of the uh, national African American media buys for the Biden Harris campaign, but they have been making. I mean, this this campaign has invested more money into Black media and Hispanic media than any other presidential campaign, including mm. Obama campaign in 08 and 12, as well as Hillary in 16. So, all right, Sister so, so Watson, I, if I may, I just want to restate something and, and ask what the colleagues think of this because it still hits my heart. I wonder, could we imagine a black collective where we, are, where we have a corporation, for lack of a better word, I'll defer to more scholar colleagues to, to name this better, but each of our programs and spaces, we're all doing great work, but we're all doing great work in isolation of one another and within systems where we are few in numbers anyway, and within those numbers, few of us are woke. So it seems to me that if we could form some type of a formal black collective, and Attorney Humphreys, maybe you could help us with this, where we have this global mission statement that we're all signing off on while we're still doing our own individual work so that we can decide as, an, as a corporation where we will galvanize and leverage this collective power. So, we're, so we won't have to look for each other or, 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 or just now start introducing and, and, and actualizing what Sister Clayton was saying in terms of relational organizing. That way, I, I just want to put that out and see, can we imagine a formal black collective? That's a great transition to uh, 
help move us toward closing as attorney Derek Humphreys, our sponsor of the Black Congress on Health Law and Economics, who's been wonderful at assembling this fantastic panel today to talk about the role of BCHLE, which kind of answers that call. Go ahead, Derek. It is. The Black Con Congress on Health Law and Economics was established by a doctor in Oakland some 30 years ago to bring together all the African-American professional organizations and then some. And it's expanded. We've kept it alive. It's been, it's been, it's been on the ropes financially, but we've kept it alive. And Dr. Jackson, the result of that is, is this broadcast right now, where we've come together and through the graciousness and support of the Honorable Joanne Watson, who incidentally also worked and was the, was the powerful voice behind Congressman John Conyers. And he was in Congress, as well as the voice in the city of Detroit, which had Detroit declare voting day a holiday. Have you heard that this time around? It should be a holiday. That's right. Okay. The corporations in Detroit, the labor unions joined with the city and had all of its workers take a holiday because That's the right. most important thing was to go to the polls and vote. You better say it. Okay. And so we do have that. But Dr. Jackson, thank you for lifting that up because you would like for you to be one of the leaders across the country who says teamwork makes the dream work. All right, now. We can, we can do that. We want to so, thank all of you for being very, very special guests on this historic Get Out the Vote program. And uh, we declare that we will get out the vote. We claim it. We will make it manifest in 2020. We will have perfect vision at the polls. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our guests. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all who are watching, all who are listening, all who are supporting this wake-up call. I'm Joanne Watson signing off, and thank you, co-host Attorney Jerry Humphreys. Thank you, our sponsor, Black Congress on Health Law and Economics, and all the participants this magnificent panel. Have a magnificent day. Wake up, Detroit. Wake up, world. Wake up, Detroit. Thank you, wake everyone. Up, Detroit. Bless wake family. up, world. Wake up, call. Mm -hmm. Bless family. When a brown girl child is born, the earth shifts. The sun is at half mask. The moon waits for her first cry. The ancestors set the table. The flowers turn red as blood. This is your land, continent daughter. With tree trunk legs and branches for arms, this is your soil. Black and fertile as your eyes facing an apartheid Jim Crow current past memory. Some of us begin the removal of shackles at birth. We grow into the armor of struggle quickly. We brew courage in our tea, blend bravery into our Sunday dinners. Joanne Watson, you understand nation building is not a part-time job. This dedicated life is sometimes lonely, a vulnerable choice, but it is the only way you know how to operate. You are wired for the movement in your black women bones, even when tired, still fighting, still organizing, still singing morning spirituals. You are born to lead, even in your own family. The